Well, welcome everybody. This is uh, Pastor Jay, and uh, for the last few weeks we've been studying the vineyard values and distinctives, and tonight we're going to take a little bit different turn. First of all, um, as we've been talking about what it is to be a vineyard and, and what, uh, what makes vineyard unique, some of you may have wondered, well, how come Pastor Jay's doing this teaching? Why isn't it Pastor Carl that's doing it? And to, that, to answer that question, um, I need to give you a little bit of, of a history. And so I'm going to start off with telling you a little bit about myself. Here is uh, my story. Um, I grew up in, in a home with, uh, uh, where my father was a pastor, and I was, uh, uh, had this heritage that uh, my mother, from a very young age, my mother would uh, uh, pray with me before I went to bed, read me a Bible story. Um, at, at a young age, she bought me my own Bible, and I started studying and I started reading it. Um, when we moved to Puerto Rico, um, I went to uh, a Christian school. I went to the Wesleyan Academy because they were one of the few schools that were uh, mostly in English. And so I am thankful that uh, I had that kind of upbringing. And then when I was um, in high school, I was the leader of our youth group. And uh, shortly after high school, I went off to college first to study engineering. That's something that Carl and I both have in common. We both started studying engineering. But uh, somewhere along the line, probably my second year of college, I received my calling to the ministry and I came to the States to study for the ministry. Now, I had a very um, rude awakening when I came here to the States to study for the ministry because um, the church in the college where I went to was, I mean, it's culture shock, night and day from what it was in Puerto Rico. Even though Puerto Rico was a denominational church, um, it was a Wesleyan church, um, we had a band, yes, we had piano and organ, but we had drums and electric guitar and tambourines and all that kind of stuff. And after the sermon, we had a time of praying for each other, which is what we call ministry time or prayer time. When I came to the States, it was a one-hour service, and it was three hymns. And the hymn book that um, they had did not have a single hymn from the 20th century. They were at least from, from the 19th century. And you sang them to this huge pipe organ, and everybody dressed to the nines. I mean, it was suit and tie and all that. 20-minute um, sermon, and then right after the sermon, they did the benediction, and you were out. And I was just like, whoa, this is really different than what I'm used to. Then I came to uh, uh, Florida after uh, getting ready for the ministry through a, yet another denomination that was very similar to the Wesleyans, the Free Methodist denomination. Really good people, really good friends there. And we planted a church here in Tampa. And uh, that church, uh, the Free Methodist Church, helped us out with equipment and a little bit of financial support to get us started. And we started going. But after about two years, I'd say, um, that church just wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't growing. Nothing much was happening. And we were wondering what we were doing wrong. And so we went to a conference, a church planting conference up in Atlanta. It just so happens that this conference was being put on by the Vineyard because the Vineyard had a church up in Atlanta. And we just loved everything that we heard. Uh, the senior pastor and myself drove together, and we loved everything that, they heard, that we heard. For me in particular, it was just something that just really piqued my interest, because even though I had been a part of all these denominations that were a part of what's known as the Holiness Movement, Nazarene, Free Methodist, uh, Salvation Army, um, Wesleyan, all those, those denominations, I had formulated 
my own theology based on my reading of the scriptures. Now, in most every single denomination that there is, if you want to be a member of that denomination, you have to study their rules book. In the case of these uh, denominations, the holiness denominations, it's called the discipline. So the Wesleyan discipline or the free Methodist discipline. And you have to agree with all their theology. And then if you agreed with all the theology, you signed a piece of paper saying, I agree with all this, I will endeavor to live my life this way. Well, I could never really bring myself to sign it because while most of the stuff was scriptural, was right on and all that, some of the things I thought put a different emphasis on things. And I wasn't seeing the things that I was seeing in the Bible. I wasn't seeing uh, the signs and wonders. I wasn't seeing people healed. Uh, I wasn't seeing uh, people delivered from demons. I wasn't seeing uh, signs and wonders. I wasn't seeing that. I wasn't seeing the move of the Holy Spirit that I had read in all the books from all these denominations. I'd seen, read all their books, and, and they talked about all these times where the Holy Spirit had moved, but yet I wasn't feeling that in the church. So I started reading the stuff of the vineyard, and basically I found my tribe. It wasn't that I became vineyard. I was vineyard. I just didn't know it. So we um, decided as a leadership and then uh, unanimously as the body that we were going to secede from the Free Methodist Church and that we were going to become a vineyard. Now, that was about a year process to do that. Now, the Free Methodist Church bless their hearts. They were very gracious to us. They blessed us. They let us keep all the equipment. They didn't have to do that. They were wonderful to us. So I'm not, not criticizing them in any way because they were, they were wonderful to us. And then around 19, the latter part of 1987, 1988, uh, we became a vineyard. And that was the first vineyard in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, a few years later, uh, John Stearns, and a few other people, myself, started the uh, Clearwater Vineyard. Uh, originally, it was called the Mariner's Vineyard, but the vineyard wanted everything to have a location name, so it became the Clearwater Vineyard. And then from there, I uh, left to uh, plant my own church, Hearts Cry Christian Church. So from the late 80s, I was involved with the vineyard. I got to see the vineyard develop. This was a time in the late 80s when there wasn't a lot of contemporary Christian music. Most music, most worship in churches was hymns. And this, the vineyard was the one that was introducing this new form of worship, this rock type of worship with drums and guitars and all of this. Um, so I have a lot of experience with the vineyard. I got to fly out to Anaheim, which was the, uh, the mother church for the vineyard. That's where John Wimber uh, had been the pastor. I got to meet him. I got to sit under his teachings. I bought his books. I bought his videos. I bought his tapes. And I just loved the way that he just matter-of-factly expounded on the word and made it so that yeah yeah that's it that's what i believe that's that's what the church ought to be doing this is great i want to do this let's go i also fell in love with with the worship of the vineyard it was god word it was very focused on on god but it was also very even though it was a rock generation music, it was very focused on intimacy. It was very focused on, on telling Jesus and on telling God how much we loved them, how much we, we wanted to be with them, how much we wanted to serve them, how much we depended upon them, and, and all those kind of things. And I just, uh, I just fell in love with, with the worship. I mean, uh, at the Tampa Vineyard at the time, uh, we'd do 40, 45 minutes of worship. And uh, 
the, the Holy Spirit would just show up during worship. I mean, people would get filled with the Holy Spirit. People would come to the altar during worship. They, 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 they'd be flat on their faces. The Holy Spirit would come on people. It was a phenomenal time of worship. Um, we were worshiping Him. We were blessing Him. And He showed up during our worship and ministered to us. And we learned the five-step prayer model. And our, our ministry times after the sermons we're going 20, 25 minutes, half an hour, because God was really showing up during the, the ministry time. And then, of course, we were doing what we called back then, uh, we didn't call them small groups, we called them kinships, because people were like small family groups in homes. And again, God was showing up in the small groups as we were studying the Bible, things, the Holy Spirit would just show up. And just incredible things were happening in our small groups. And so um, I had been a part of the vineyard for a very, very long time. I've seen, uh, I've seen four uh, national leaders, starting with John Wimber up to uh, through Burt Wagner and uh, now with Phil Strout. I have seen the vineyard grow into an international movement. Uh, with, with Bob and Ellen Mumford, kind of the overseers of the international vineyard movement and uh, kind of keeping tabs on all that. There are now well over 60 countries with their own independent uh, vineyards, um, well over 2,000 churches all over the world and all of that. So I am what's known as a first generation vineyard guy. I've, I've, I've seen it, I've experienced it, I've learned the teachings. And so this is something that is very much a part of who I am and a part of my DNA. And so I get very excited teaching about this stuff because I believe in this stuff. It's not just stuff that's out there and that, oh, this just happens to be what we believe in. No, this is, this is who we are. This is our DNA. We live this stuff. Carl uh, was in seminary, and he was in seminary for if, at a reform seminary because that's a part of the denomination that that he grew up with and that he was initially going to be a pastor with. And while he was in seminary, he read some of, of the teachings of John Wimber, especially on power evangelism and power healing, and he really loved it. He he really became part of that. And even though he was very successful up in Canada, um, uh, developed a large church up there, he developed a very successful city church movement up there. Um, when he came down here to Florida, um, for health reasons and other th reasons to be close to, to, to his father and all that, um, he looked for a vineyard here and uh, found one that Steve Shogren, who used to be the pastor of the Cincinnati Vineyard, he had planted a church, but then after a while he decided he was going to do something else, and he basically told Carl, here, this is your church now. And so Carl has, is, is, is familiar with the vineyard, but he is part of what's known as Generation 2 of the vineyard. So um, a lot of these things that he has studied, I have lived. So that's part of the reason why I'm teaching on vineyard values and distinctives. So in my own personal history, some of the things that you need to know is that I was a midlife baby. When I was born, my father was 47. My mom had had uh, a miscarriage before me. Uh, she'd had a baby that lived to be two weeks old before it was killed in a car accident. And for years, um, she tried and, and couldn't, couldn't get pregnant. And she, she, desperately wanted, uh, she desperately wanted a child. And she was getting up there in years. And so she finally made a pact with the Lord and said, Lord, if you give me a child, um, I will dedicate that child to you. And so the Lord blessed her with, with me, and uh, uh, towards the latter stages of the pregnancy, my mom moved to Puerto Rico because she wanted me to be born uh, in Puerto Rico. But she had a very difficult pregnancy with me. 
Um, she uh, had to be bedridden for several months, hardly could keep any food down and all that. Um, but finally, even though it was a very difficult uh, childbirth, my um, umbilical cord was wrapped around my neck and all that, I was born C-section and my mom uh, honored her commitment to the Lord and dedicated me to the Lord. And so I have that heritage. I have that heritage. And when God called me to the ministry, which really wasn't something that I was planning on, it just felt like a continuation of that promise, a continuation of that heritage. And I just love the vineyard. And so when we discovered Jesus Church, actually was the very first Sunday that, that it was called Jesus Church was when he came. We just felt like we were home. Uh, Charlene has been a part of the vineyard probably since 1997, probably since 1997. So again, she has experienced a lot of things uh, firsthand and uh, she is a vineyardite herself. Um, so one of our values, one of the things that is important to us is the main and the plain. What do we mean by the main and the plain? In a moment, I'm going to be playing a video, a video by Eleanor Mumford, and Eleanor Mumford, I mean, she is just, uh, she's an older lady, but she is, she is full of the Holy Spirit. She's an exciting lady. She, she just, she just loves the vineyard. She loves the gospel. She loves the ministry, and uh, she'll talk to us a little bit more about the main and the plain and what it means to the vineyard. But I want to explain it in my own terms. A lot of, just about every single denomination has been born out of something else. For example, for a long time, it was just the Roman Catholic Church. Um, there was the Orthodox Church in, in the Eastern part of the world and all that. But for the most part, it was Roman Catholic Church. But then during the Reformation, they ended up establishing what's called the Protestant Church because they were protesting the excesses, the frauds, the, the, the sinful things that they were seeing that were happening in the Roman Catholic Church. They weren't trying to start a new movement. They weren't trying to start a new denomination. They were just trying to reform their own church. They wanted their own church to go back to the ways of the Bible and, and to get away from some of the things that they felt were um, extra biblical, that had become a part of the Catholic Church that really weren't based on the scriptures. But when that Reformation didn't happen because Rome totally uh, rejected it and attacked it, then churches like um, the Reformed churches, Churches like uh, 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 the Lutheran churches and all that, they grew out of a disagreement and a different theology than they had with the Catholic Church. So now you have um, the Reformation movement and you have John Calvin who is uh, studying the Word and writing his own theology. And he comes up with certain points that are very important to him. One is predestination, that um, basically um, God is sovereign and he chooses who gets saved. He has things like um, uh, eternal security, that once you are saved, that you are always saved. On the other side of the equation, you have other denominations that grow out of uh, the Lutheran church, especially um, in England because of politics and because the King of England wants to get a divorce and he wants to be in charge of what his church says or does, he develops what's called the Anglican Church. He withdraws from, from, from the Roman Church and he starts the Anglican Church, which is based a little bit on the teachings of Luther and a little bit on the teachings of Calvin. They reject the cult of Mary. They reject... Uh, that priests can't be married, and those kind of things. Now, little by little, there 
are other divisions that begin to happen as people see different points of theology that see is very important and they want to differentiate themselves from somebody else. So, for example, when I was uh, a teenager uh, in Puerto Rico, I went to this uh, uh, American church, this English-speaking church, which I really liked a lot. It had a really good um, youth group. And one of the things that uh, uh, they did as a youth group and all that is that they did uh, model kits, airplanes and cars and all that. That was one of the activities that they did. And I love that. And so I started asking the pastor about, you know, if, if I wanted to become a member, um, what I had to do. I'm about 14 or 15 at the time. And he's telling me about his church and all that. And, and I, I'm like, you what I'm hearing. But then he says to me, um, you'd have to be baptized. Said, and I said to him, well, I've already been baptized because I accepted Christ when I was seven. And, you know, it wasn't just a little kid thing. I, I truly believed that when I accepted Christ when I was seven. And then when I was 12, I read in the Bible that, you know, 12, 13, that, that's the age of accountability uh, in the Bible. And that, uh, and so I made the choice that I knew the difference between right and wrong, and that I wanted to live for Christ. And so I was baptized. And I was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I was dunked. I wasn't sprinkled. But he was telling me that that baptism was not valid. I said, "What do you mean it's not valid?" He said, "Because if you're going to be named, baptized in the name of the Father." and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, you have to be dunked three times. So in the name of the Father, dunk you again in the name of the Son, dunk you in the name of the, name of the Holy Spirit. And the air went out of my bubble. And so, so many denominations. Then on the other side, you have, you know, our, our, our Pentecostal friends who believe in, in healing. And we believe in healing, but they believe that if you pray for healing, people are going to get healed. It has to happen. If it doesn't happen, it's because of lack of faith. Or they believe that the gift of tongues is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Well, there's a lot of specific theologies that if you study different denominations, you're going to find. And if you go, on, go to look at for this kind of stuff in the vineyard, for example, uh, the, the, the millennial rule of Christ, does it happen before he comes, after he comes? Uh, you know, is it tribulation before or after, all that kind of stuff. If you look for that stuff in the vineyard, you're not going to find it. Because we like to stick to the main and the plain of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All these other things, you can have your own opinions on it. You can develop your own theology, and that's great. We love you for it. Um, it doesn't mean that because uh, you have this theology or that theology, you can't join the vineyard. You can you just are going to, on some things, we're not going to, we're going to agree to disagree on. But we're going to stick with the main of the plane. So let's watch a short video by Eleanor Mumford. Talk about the main and the plane. The, we are for the main and the plane. What do we mean by this phrase? We mean keeping the main thing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the main thing, the plain thing, and the plain thing, the main thing, and not deviating from it, that the things that are central to our faith remain central, that they are not allowed to slip to the periphery, that the things that are characteristic of pure, unvarnished Christianity remain that way, that the things that remain front and center do remain front and center. Our love for the scriptures, our belief in the gospel, all the wonderful things that we hold so dear. That we don't drift off and get caught up with something rather esoteric or just plain weird. Oh, God save us from the weird. <laughs> just, you know, I shouldn't say. What has always been main and plain to orthodox, historic Christianity must remain so within the vineyard. And isn't it interesting... Isn't it interesting how the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians? I read this again and my heart sang. 1 Corinthians 15. Now, brothers and sisters, 
One might even add to say, brothers and sisters of the vineyard, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you believed in vain. For what I received, says Paul, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. This is the main and the blame. This is the gospel of Jesus. This is the hill on which we will die. We are evangelicals. We are for the gospels, the gospel. It matters to us. It's what we carry. It's what is so precious, as Paul says, as you hold out the words of life to those who are perishing. That's what we do. That's what we carry. The gospel is the good news of salvation. It is the gospel. And it's everything that our world needs because anyone who is without Christ is without hope in the world. But we have him. We have him. And like John said, this is all about Jesus. It's all about his gospel. And it's all about taking it to the lost. Isn't that wonderful? We want to stay in the main plane of the gospel because when we're sharing the gospel with people, they're not going to ask all these uh, deep theological questions. They just want to know that God loves them, that Christ died on the cross for them, and that he is going to save them, that they're going to have eternal life, that that slavery that they had to sin is no longer there. And so we like to stick with the main and the plane of the gospel. We're also a people of the scriptures. The scriptures are our gold standards, our plumb line, our north star. Everything that we do and say has to measure up against the scriptures. We're not going to come up with different things that we cannot point to the scriptures and say, this is okay. That is our plumb line. We want the whole counsel of God, not just the verses that fit our teaching. We want to be able to go um, verse to verse, chapter through chapter through the Bible and, and deal with the difficult things. Um, if you've been a part of Jesus Church for any length of time and you've heard Carl's sermons, you've, you've heard them tackle some very difficult passages, some things that a lot of churches don't, you know, kind of stay away from and don't want to deal with. But we believe in the whole counsel of God, that the scripture, all of it, is there for us to, to, to use, is there because God wanted us to have. Now, we believe that the Holy Spirit is going to illuminate some things. We believe the Holy Spirit is going to expand our understanding of things, that the Holy Spirit is going to continually reveal the Father to us and point us to Christ. But it will never, ever be in conflict with the Word. It will never go beyond the Word. And so these are things that I think um, anchor us and make us make the vineyard a safe place because we're always going to stick to what the Word says. I can remember when we're talking about a time when the Holy Spirit had fallen uh, in one of his services and uh, people had uh, fallen to the ground or the people were were, were were shaking, some people were crying, some people were, were laughing and, and, and you know, People weren't used to this. You know, they were just used to regular churches, you know, where you kind of sit there and all that and, and you know, you leave it at the end. But the Holy Spirit was falling and some stuff was happening. And so the next day as he's, he's going to his office there's some people in front of the church just very angry. It's like, what's going on in this church? You know, is, is you know, what's, what's going to happen here? And, and, and John just kind of looked at them and he said, folks, don't worry. It won't go beyond what's written in this book. And pointing to his Bible. And then he kind of smirks and he said, and they took comfort in that. 
we should take comfort in that because nothing that we ever do will go beyond the Bible. But if you've read your Bible, if you've read the things that Jesus did, if you've read the things that happened with Paul and the disciples and the things that happened when the Holy Spirit came, some pretty wild stuff. But it will never go beyond the scriptures. And like Eleanor said, God save us from the weird. And so I just want to let you know that we are a people of the scriptures and that we will always stick to the main and the plain. I hope tonight was uh, beneficial to you. Um, join us next week at 7 p.m.